Okay, what I want to talk about now is internal load, something that has been around for a long time, but I left. I look back at the original diagnostic feasibility studies I wrote in the mid 1980s, and I barely talked about it. So obviously in 35 years, we have learned a lot here and we've learned out how important this really is. Again, it's that whole thing of the leaky boat. The, the, the leaks are important, but once the boat is full of water, the leaks, <laughs> you know, it, it, a little leak isn't gonna matter at that point. You, you're already overwhelmed. And it takes a lot to get that water out of the boat. It's a tiny bilge pump or you gotta do it by hand. Internally loaded nutrients, especially phosphorus, can have a disproportionately large impact on algae growth and bloom formation. Uh, think about it. It happens with warmer water and low oxygen. That's what happens during the summer growing season. It can occur in shallower deep water, although there's a higher probability in deep water. Phosphorus tends to be much more available to algae when it comes out of the sediment than it is when it comes from the water supply, the water, from the watershed. Watershed inputs are rarely more than 50% available phosphorus, often less than 25%. It's sticks and leaves and soil particles and other things. That's high turbidity. Turbidity is not dissolved stuff. The stuff that comes out in the lake that gets recycled, it's all available, 100% of it, ready to go, ready to be taken up. It can support growth in the water column or on the sediment, the sediment water interface. And because technically, relatively more phosphorus is released than nitrogen from sediment, it has a low NP ratio. There's still more nitrogen than phosphorus, but the ratios are often three to one, five to one, maybe seven to one. That's like a giant neon sign for cyanobacteria, here you go. It, it, 10 to one below that, cyanobacteria are favored because many of them can fix gaseous nitrogen and use that as a source of nitrogen. Uh, so when the nitrogen's low, they don't care. When you have 20 or 30 to one nitrogen to phosphorus, that favors the green algae. Now they may still be a problem, but they're not cyanobacteria, they're not typically toxic. Um, it's a better situation and they're more edible unless it's the huge mats. And that picture at the bottom, you're really looking at a core from an artificial lake that had a clay liner created in the 1800s. Now you're looking at about a foot of black oozy material on top of it, just loaded with organic matter that sucks the oxygen out of the overlying water and loaded with phosphorus that can come out when that happens. All right, the mechanisms of phosphorus released from sediment. It can be resuspended by boats and wind. Uh, in shallow areas, boats can make a difference. There are hardly any boats that mix down to more than 15 feet. You can look at the wake boats and the jet skis and big pontoon boats. They don't mix much below 15 feet. Um, so in deeper water, they're not really an influence. Shallow water, sure, but they ought to be staying a decent distance offshore, which ought to put them in deeper water. Uh, wind, on the other hand, knows no regulation. It just goes where it wants to go and it can mix things up. Oftentimes it comes up and those sediment particles settle right back down and not very much phosphorus is transferred, but it could be. Fish, fish can eat stuff down there. They can eat plants, they're gonna eat uh, and stir up the muck and they may absorb or, or ingest muck and it comes out the other end as usable nutrients. So they're an issue, but again, unless your lake is dominated by carp and cat fish, it's probably not gonna be the dominant source. Release from aquatic plants. Some plants are leaky during the season. Milfoil in particular, you often find filamentous algae growing around it because it leaks nutrients out of it. Uh, certainly when they decay and senesce in the fall, they release nutrients. And that's basically a pump from the sediment into the water column. Again, unless you've got a big shallow lake, the rooted plants don't represent a dominant component over the entire lake. Um, released by benthic invertebrates or fish that actually ingest it and move it out. It happens. Um, it's never been a big influence in most of the lakes I've worked in, but yes, it exists. Released by mineralization, just natural decay when there's oxygen present, absolutely happens. I do have one lake that has a serious phosphorus problem because of decay of organic matter. It doesn't have an oxygen problem. So it's definitely, or, you know, basic oxygenated decay, but it definitely gets an increase with no inflow coming and it can go from 30 micrograms per liter in the spring to over hundred by September. So this is a real influence. Many lakes, it's not that big an influence. Um, I've not found it to be the dominant situation in most lakes I've worked on. Release by redox reactions. That's oxidation reduction reactions that occur 
because compounds or reactions are looking for oxygen, looking for electron acceptors. They are trying to do things that require oxygen, like almost all metabolism of aerobic organisms. If you run out of oxygen, they will take that oxygen off of nitrate. Eventually they'll take it off of sulfate, which leads to hydrogen sulfide, if you ever smelled that in your lake. And that's as bad as it gets in terms of low oxygen conditions and these redox reactions. The reason that I don't say it's just a matter of oxygen, the redox reactions can start happening that could release phosphorus out of the sediment when the oxygen is below about two milligrams per liter. It's gonna happen for sure when the oxygen hits zero. But the catch is redox potential doesn't stop at zero oxygen. The demand keeps growing and you can have more and more oxygen demand. Therefore, it's gonna rip the oxygen off of any compound it can find in that sediment and you're going to get more release. So the rates of release keep going and keep accelerating even after you've run out of oxygen. So that's a real critical aspect. We have a lot of lakes, huge number of lakes that lose their oxygen at the bottom. Even if you've got oxygen down to what seems like the bottom, even in shallow water, you stick that probe right in the sediment, which most DO probe people tell you don't do, but I do it all the time. <laughs> you may find that you've got low oxygen there, which means there's redox reactions going on, phosphorus is becoming available, and algae that grow at the sediment water interface have a ready source. They don't need it to be in the water column. They can accumulate it there and then pop up into the water column. Now, once they're up in the water column, they've only got the picnic lunch they packed. If there's lots of phosphorus in the water column, either because of internal loading or because you didn't do a good job in the watershed, okay, they might keep right on growing. But even without the high phosphorus or nitrogen in the water column, you could still have blooms because the phosphorus is available in the bottom. And I maintain that that is the dominant mechanism of bloom formation in our lakes. Having high phosphorus in the water column is the dominant means of blooms continuing on. But I've seen lots of lakes where it pops up, it lasts a week or two and it's gone. It's not good, but it's better than all summer long because there isn't the phosphorus source in the water column. All right, just to hammer this home, think in terms of what an oxygen profile looks like in a lake. And in June, you know, maybe the very deepest area is an octave. In July, a bunch more of it has gotten low oxygen. And by August, quite a bit more has become. And as, as this anoxic interface rises in the water column, you go from just a little bit of the sediment being exposed to low oxygen to a much bigger area, to a bigger area, to all the way up to here. Now we've got phosphorus being released into the bottom waters. We have possible light penetrating well beyond the thermocline. Typically light penetrates to three times the second depth. And the thermocline is usually between one and two secchi depths. So it can get below it. And you could have algae growing right here everywhere. You could also have them growing on the sediment throughout this area down to the point where there's not enough light. So it might really be happening just in the upper two or three panels there. And then those algae can jump up and become a problem. Now, if your lake is shallow, it doesn't mean this isn't happening. It just it means there's no blockage of it. It just goes right into the water column or the entire bottom is subject to algal growth and they can pop up. If you have a lot of plants present, you may have an oxygen limitation. You may have other allelopathic interferences that minimize the algal growth. But the reality is a shallow lake is just as subject to potential algal bloom formation from internal recycling as a deep lake. All right, this is back to something I started at the beginning. Algae have different ecological strategies. Maybe growth in the surface water, and it certainly happens. Growth at the benthic interface in shallow water, mostly the green mats. Growth at the benthic interface at intermediate depth, anoxic sediment, but some light. That's most of the cyanobacteria. And growth near the thermocline, which tends to be a lot of the goldens and some of the cyanobacteria. So knowing what algae you have will tell you something about where the phosphorus is coming from. And you know the, the gliotrichia, the villicospermum, the aphanosoma, and the microcystis, they're all classic, start their growth on the bottom and pop up. Wordachinia also, that tends to be less often toxic. Planktothrix tends to grow in the metalimnia near the thermocline. Same for Sudanabena and a lot of the lingbias, the planktolingbias, the ones that are planktonic. They've divide, subdivided the lingbias into a bunch of groups here. Chrysosphorella sinura, also mid-depth growers. 
Uh, and then the green mats in the upper right, those tend to be the shallow water forms. Now they overlap some. It's not like you can't ever find one in the other's territory. And in fact, when the blue greens pop up, the wind tends to blow them to shore and accumulate them. So don't think they came from that shoreline sediment. They just got blown in there, but that's where the risk of the toxicity is greatest. Okay, ways to control it. Well, obviously you get rough fish removal. You can eliminate nutrient regeneration by that means. Pretty hard to do and not usually the main reason you're getting excessive nutrients out of the sediment. But yeah, it, it, it could be done. Uh, rooted plant assemblies, they can be algal inhibitors. You get a real coating of water lilies or worse yet, duckweed, you won't have any light. You may not have any oxygen either underneath there. And that's gonna be hard for the algae to grow. Uh, a nice, healthy assemblage of aquatic plants will often tie up nutrients even in the sediment. And some things will come out of the water column such that you would not expect algae to bloom around them, except those that are taking advantage of the leakiness of those plants, often filamentous greens, rarely at a, a level that you'd really be worried about. On the other hand though, rooted plants can be algal promoters. They are leaky. They do senesce and release phosphorus. Uh, so there, there's a double-edged sword here. Again, it's biological interactions. They're always more complicated than physical or chemical. Okay, selective withdrawal. This is a really interesting one. In fact, I, I'm right now revising the uh, practical guide for management of lakes in Massachusetts along with a colleague. I just finished doing the selective withdrawal one today, so it's really fresh in my mind. This is where you put a pipe out into deeper water, and rather than discharging the normal overflow from your lake, you discharge the deep water. You can't pump too much or even let it go selectively before you draw the lake down. So there's a limit to how much you can put out unless you're allowed to do it as a drawdown. Um, if you don't do it fast enough to keep the bottom water being exchanged, it may go anoxic on you. And now you're discharging low oxygen, high phosphorus water downstream. And that's not gonna sit real well with the permit community. So you may have to treat it. Um, if you have a shallow lake, and like the one I mentioned where it goes from about 30 micrograms per liter in the spring to over hundred in the fall, they've been dropping that water level by a permitted drawdown immediately at the end of summer and flushing all that high water quality or high quality, high phosphorus water downstream. It's not high quality because it's mixed at that point. It doesn't have low oxygen, but it's loaded with nutrients. And over time that does gradually get rid of the reserve of nutrients. But again, we're talking 20 to 30 years. In that particular case, they've only been doing it for 10 years and it hasn't made enough difference yet. Uh, the Ponset Reservoir in Foxborough went from over 100 micrograms per liter to about 24 as an average in 2021 years. Again, I don't know anybody, I don't have any clients that are willing to wait that long for improvement. It is a relatively efficient, low cost means for getting poor quality water out of your lake and downstream. It will help your lake. It may make less of an oxygen demand, it should give you less phosphorus in the water. In the long run, it may exhaust some of those internal loads, but it's got a lot of downsides on the downstream part. So it's a hard one to pass off in many cases. Dredging. If money and permits were no object, I would dredge a lot of lakes. Uh, dredging is phenomenal. You take out that sediment base. You've now gotten rid of the offending sediment. You don't have the oxygen demand. You don't have the <clears throat> high nutrient levels. You don't have the seeds, the of rooted plants or the resting stages of algae. I have seen this take lakes that were just choked with green mats and haven't seen a green mat in them in 20 years. It works really, really well to totally reset the lake, but that's what it is. It's a total reset. I mean, there's a lake being dredged in the dry. There is no lake. You know, where'd the fish go? You know, you, you've destroyed the lake per se and you have to now rebuild it. Well, I mentioned a lot of our lakes are human created. I don't have a problem with going to those that, you know, I'm just gonna drain, drain this and start over. But somebody in a permit position may have a problem with that because a lot of the laws under the Wetlands Protection Act in Massachusetts and many other states don't have a differentiator for man-made versus natural lake. And certainly if I went to a kettle hole lake, uh, with no inlet, no outlet, just water sitting there mostly fed by groundwater precipitation, I don't have any way to draw that down to do it in the dry, I have to do it hydraulically. That gets hard to do deeper than about 15 feet, which is where most of the muck's gonna be. Uh, and then you've got to pump it somewhere and deal with it. Uh, it is really hard to get permits. I, I say, at least in Massachusetts, 
it's easier to get a permit to assemble and detonate a small nuclear device than it is to get a permit to dredge. Um, it's been done. I've had a couple in the last 10 years, but there's an awful lot of lakes that really need a total redo because of what's accumulated in them. And it's hard to get this done. It's very expensive. Um, I will throw out a number there. Thirty to fifty thousand dollars per acre foot of sediment minimum. That's a lot of money. I mean, millions of dollars typically done. The last two I did were over eight hundred thousand dollars each, and we did a single digit number of acres. So tremendous results, but really, really expensive. Okay, phosphorus inactivation. I probably do more of this than anything else these days. Not that I like it better philosophically. I'd love to clean up all the watersheds and magically make the in-lake problem go away, but it's incredibly flexible. It's incredibly effective and it is affordable and you can use it multiple ways. Um, these are basically anti-fertilizer treatments. You're putting in a binder that I should have said earlier, that the primary atom to which the phosphorus is bound is iron. It can be on manganese, it can be on calcium, it can be on aluminum, but the places where we have the redox sensitive phosphorus is mostly on iron compounds. And the iron going from ferric to ferrous iron, giving up an oxygen releases the phosphorus. So the issue is finding a replacement for iron that will not give up the phosphorus when oxygen is low. And the best one we have is aluminum. Calcium works well, but only in, in a, a high pH environment. In a low pH environment, which is most of our lakes, I mean, less than seven, um, it, the calcium is going to dissolve and the phosphorus is going to go with it. So if you're out in the Berkshires of Massachusetts, the Litchfield Hills of Connecticut, certain other areas that have high calcareous soils, you actually have natural inactivation going on all the time, and you can do this with calcium. But mostly we use aluminum. In Australia, they came up with lanthanum-based stuff. Lanthanum does a good job. It's very specific for phosphorus. And they impregnate it in clay. It's called phoslock is the product. Then they put that in the water. Um, it can take out the phosphorus, the, the readily available phosphorus, the dissolved phosphorus. It doesn't act as a coagulant like aluminum does. So it's not going to clear your water column. But that, the clay kind of coats the bottom area and may actually decrease your oxygen demand somewhat. So there's some benefits to be had there. It is more expensive than aluminum. It's not approved in all states. Of course, aluminum's not approved everywhere either. I know, and I think it's Ontario, Canada, they try to avoid aluminum, um, but they'll let you use Phoslock. Uh, down here in Massachusetts, Phoslock is not yet approved, not for any particularly good reason. It just hasn't been approved yet. Um, and so we can only use aluminum. Okay, so the factors in planning a treatment, well, you gotta understand the existing phosphorus load, the internal versus the external. If your internal load is at least 25% internal, if your existing total load is 25% internal, you got to look at that internal load because most of the external load is distributed fairly equally around the seasons. If anything, it's shifted into the spring. Uh, the internal load is predominantly a summer phenomenon. It can happen under the ice in winter, it can happen spring and fall slightly, but the major, major time is summer with low oxygen and into the fall. So it's coming at the worst time. All 25% happen there, whereas everything else is divided along the year and isn't any more than what that internal load is during the summer. If the internal load is more than half the total, you got to look at it. That's the, the boat full of water. There's no way you're going to fix the lake without dealing with the internal load. Uh, the types of available sediment phosphorus, you know, the iron bound versus biogenic. The biogenic is the stuff that's subject to mineralization and decay. If there's a lot of that, it's going to be released slowly, but it's going to be released. And it may then bind with iron and become part of that redox related loop. The system bathymetry and hydrology matter, potential water chemistry alteration. If low pH, you've got to buffer the system so that you're not creating aluminum toxicity. Lanthanum has much less of a toxicity issue. Um, oxygen will matter. Potentially sensitive receptors, fish, soil, plankton, macroinvertebrates, reptiles, amphibians, waterfall, the whole gamut. Again, done right. Um, we haven't had a problem with aluminum treatments in over 20 years, but some of the early ones killed a bunch of fish. Yeah. Uh, potentially uh, accumulating residues. I have actually only seen one place ever where repeat treatments resulted in a lot of residue. And oddly enough, that was at Universal Studios in Florida. And Disney does the same thing. It doesn't have any problem. 
So I guess there's something to be said for the Disney magic. But uh, in lakes up here, it, it really isn't that much. And it goes into the sediment and helps congeal it. Uh, we have not had an issue with accumulated material. I've got one lake where we treat the inflows for a part of May and all of June and into July, and we've never seen the accumulation. It just isn't that much material. Okay, so the way you go about this is you add a compound that will bind up the phosphorus and make it unavailable to the algae. Iron's the most common natural binder, but it doesn't hold the phosphorus under an octet, so we're replacing it. I mentioned aluminum, calcium, lanthanum, there are even some settling agents that can do this. You can use them in the water column or in the sediment. Obviously, when you put it in, it's easiest to put it in the water column and let it settle. Uh, you can inject it deeper if you don't want to touch the upper water column. When you're using aluminum, though, the aluminum will coagulate phosphorus in the water column and settle that as well. It's not as efficient at the lower concentrations you see in the water column as what you will see in the sediment. But it does work. It does drop the phosphorus level. And the example I'm showing you on the bottom is a lake actually in Connecticut near Hartford. And yet before we did the treatment, you can see these incredible spikes. This one went from down around 25, 30 micrograms per liter in the spring to 300 micrograms per liter by the end of summer. And it has very little inflow during that time. So clearly this was internal recycling, but it also has an awful watershed. So for the other three, the other three seasons of the year, it's getting pounded by watershed loads of phosphorus. We clearly need to work in the watershed. And that's a whole nother story with so far, not very good results. But once we said, well, okay, what could you do here to help the lake in the interim? So we do once or twice a summer, a low dose aluminum treatment. And you can see what's happened. It's knocked it down. And because we're also inactivating what's in the sediment, we're squelching that internal load. We haven't put enough in to do the whole job yet, but you can see what's happening. Lower and lower and lower. We would like to be below that purple line. Well, we're not there most of the time. This isn't doing the job by itself. But wow, what an improvement. We have had no, that's as in zero, cyanobacteria blooms or fish kills since this treatment was done. Yet before it, all those years before, it was pea soup of blue-greens and they did have fish kills because of oxygen problems and possible toxicity. So this has been a home run in terms of improving conditions, but it's not getting the job done by itself. We still need to do a lot of watershed management there. Okay, cyanobacteria control. This is a more traditional sediment treatment. We're not doing it every year. In fact, we're calculating our dose to give us the maximum benefit for the longest period of time, which for a nutrient inactivation project is about 20 years. Because unless you manage to inactivate more than the top layer of sediment, there's phosphorus underneath that's gonna migrate up over time. We don't have a good handle on exactly how long that takes, but from empirical evidence, it looks to be about 20 years. A guy named Brian Huser with a whole lot of colleagues evaluated 114 treatments and said for the deep lake treatments, 21 years was the average. For shallow lakes, about six years, and the lakes that are somewhere in between, about 11 years. So that gives you some feel for the benefit you can get. But what I'm pointing out here is that here's a lake, a long pond out on Cape Cod that got treated pretty horrible blue-green blooms before it, not a one since. We're now 14 years out, one treatment no blue-green bloom since. Not bad. Not to say there aren't blue-greens in there, but it's never hitting 3,000, hardly ever. And it's got a much more diverse plankton assemblage that those old plankton can eat. So major success. Okay, clarity improvement. Uh, this one's Hamblin Pond, first one I ever got involved with, the poster child for phosphorus inactivation. This had horrible cyanobacteria blooms, for years before the treatment. They did this treatment in 95, which is the early days of it. We didn't completely know what we were doing. And in fact, when they did this treatment, I wasn't running it, um, they killed a lot of fish. They got the ratio of the two forms of aluminum wrong and they caused the pH to rise. And high pH aluminum toxicity is actually worse than low pH. Keep in mind all the acid rain problems in the Adirondacks in the 60s and 70s, that's aluminum toxicity from what's basically an unpermitted phosphorus inactivation project. It took the lakes dying. They were dying. They were sterile because it took out all the phosphorus. Of course, it also took out a lot of the fish because it wasn't controlled. The pH wasn't balanced. You can balance them. And again, last fish kill I know of was the year 2000. And we figured it out since then. And now it works. Look at the water clarity since then with no cyanobacteria. It was great. 
Now you can start to see the decline there. And sure enough, it all went to the proverbial hell in the handbasket in uh, the fall of 2018. We got a bloom of exactly the same algae that was here back then. And then 2019 was awful. And they said, do it again. This time we were more scientific about it. It was better run. We had no fish kill. And as you can see, the clarity is way back up. Sometimes they hit 10 meters now, it's phenomenal. And the lake's got the only really sustainable deep water trout population. They got about 10 foot of oxygen back in the bottom water. I mean, there's just nothing bad to be said about this at this point. Unfortunately, they don't all perform this well. Um, this is a lake, this is really not internal load control, but it is growth control. This is a lake outside of Boston where we have a dosing system and we inject polyaluminum chloride, which does not have a pH issue. And we treat the inflows, the two main inflows to the lake from about Memorial Day to 4th of July. That's all we do. And we clean up the water going into the lake, which flushes completely in that time. And now we have low nutrient water sitting in the lake going into summer when the flows drop off. As you can see, before we started doing this, it wasn't just blue-greens. We had lots of problems with algae. Since then, no problems. Still get some blue-greens now and then but nothing you'd call bloom, nothing that's a health hazard, no toxicity issues, it's worked very well. As you can see it climbing in recent years, we've been playing around with how low can we go? How little can we do and make this work? I think we found the answer about 2021. 2022, interesting enough, was a washout. Everything we did in June was blown away by the flows in July and August and even September that year, but the flows were so high, we got flushing features and the lake flushed like once a week and we didn't have an algae problem anyway. So it worked out in both ways. Okay, switching gears, let's catch my breath. Wet the whistle. Oxidation and circulation. Okay, if you inactivate the phosphorus, you don't have to worry about the oxygen. But why not put the oxygen back in, reclaim the habitat in its entirety and get the lake functioning as an oxic system? I mean, that just seems if you can't dredge out the sediment and you're not going to put an inactivator in, this seems like a really good way to go. The problem is we're not quite there yet on reliability. It's a chemical means it ought to be way more reliable than biological, but we're still not quite there. And there's also many ways to do this. Circulation, artificial circulation in the lake will also oxygenate the lake but it's not exactly oxygenation in the sense we're thinking of. You're just moving oxygen and air and stuff throughout the lake. And that's not a bad thing, but there's other things that go along with that circulation that may or may not be good. Oxygenation, when I use that term, I mean getting oxygen into the water, particularly the deep part, without destratifying or mixing the lake. That's totally different. The lake doesn't have to be stratified, although if it's not stratified at all, you put the oxygen in, the water's going everywhere. But even shallow lakes can be somewhat stratified. I'm talking about getting the oxygen down to the bottom where it's needed most. So oxygen and circulation are overlapping, similar, but not completely congruent techniques. And there's a lot of versions of each. Okay, the two can work by these means. And the black, both you get, you get all the black benefits from both of them. You get the extra red ones for circulation. So that makes circulation sound better than oxidation, but not necessarily. Um, so you're going to add oxygen, you're going to facilitate phosphorus binding by the natural iron or whatever else is out there. You're going to alter the pH and related water chemistry that will favor less obnoxious algal forms. Cyanobacteria like high pH water because most carbon is available as bicarbonate and they can use that, whereas other algae need carbon dioxide. Lower pH water has more carbon dioxide, does not favor cyanobacteria. Again, think about food use and food storage. You get a zooplankton refuge with oxygenation that will potentially give you some grazing capacity. Turbulence will neutralize the advantage conveyed by buoyancy mechanisms to many of those cyanobacteria. It's absolutely true that if you just mix the water without worrying about the nutrient levels, you could often get rid of the highly buoyant blue-green blooms. Unfortunately, there's lots of other algae that like to be mixed, and your lake is probably going to be just as green. It just may not be toxic. Homogenization yields consistent water quality, which if it's not very good, you're not gonna like for a recreational lake, but if you're a water supplier, you're okay with it. As long as it's constant, because you're treating it and your treatment will be the same all the time. 
the bane of the existence of water treatment plant operators is having to constantly make adjustments because the water quality is shifting. They want constancy if they can get it. All right, I'm gonna cover non-destratifying oxygenation first. That's bottom layer is oxygenated, but the top layer is not affected. You can do that by putting tiny gas bubbles of pure oxygen in deep water. And if you have at least a 20 foot vertical run, that will be absorbed before it can cause the lake to mix much. But you need that vertical run. Shallow lake, you're not gonna get that. The oldest version was hypomimetic aeration chambers where they pulled the water into the chamber with bubbled air. The air was, the oxygen was transferred from the air to the water and then the water went back down the outsides of the sleeve, it's still internal, back to where it came from. It can be effective, it's not very efficient and you're loading up a lot of nitrogen gas too. Uh, so you're putting a nutrient in that water, uh, but you are getting more oxygen in there. Again, these are known to work but now with power costs and everything, people don't do this much anymore because it's not very efficient. It can be effective. Downdraft bubble contactor or space cone, you put pure oxygen in and then you push the water down into it. The bubbles are trying to rise. If you do it right, the bubbles hold in place until they're dissolved and well oxygenated water goes out. Because you're doing this at depth, the pressure is such that you get more oxygen in the water and you get more oxygen going out. It's very efficient. Of course, managing this hard, and this thing is sitting on the bottom of the lake, if you have to you know, do something with it, you got to bring it up or you got to dive down there. So although they certainly still use these and they've had some great success stories, it's harder to do than doing what you call side stream saturation or um, uh, oxygen saturation technology, OST. The idea being that you pull the water out, super oxygenate it, and put it back where it's needed. That seems to be the way we're going for shallower lakes right now. We have one that's in its fourth year, although they totally changed the technology after two years. On Cape Cod, it's working better. It's not quite there yet. Although the current system where it's been automated and we can look online and by sensors, see what needs to be done is a vast improvement. I wouldn't say it's cheap, but it is affordable. And it may be on par with doing phosphorus inactivation, at least as um, a capital cost, you're gonna have an ongoing operational cost that you don't have with the phosphorus inactivation. But if you could regain all that habitat with oxygen, that's a home run. All right, key factors, you gotta put enough oxygen in to counter the demand. That's tricky because the demand actually increases when you add the oxygen in. Think of it like a bunch of ping pong balls in a pool. If I tell you you got one minute, go grab all you can, you'll get a fair number, but you won't get them all. If on the other hand, we create a whirlpool with the stuff moving around, you can grab a whole lot more faster because it comes to you. Well, that's what happens. We put the oxygen in, the decomposition rates will go up. It also means we may be releasing more phosphorus by decomposition. Hopefully there'll be enough binder present naturally to glom onto that and settle right back out. That's another issue. You gotta maintain oxygen suitable for target aquatic fauna. You only need about two milligrams per liter if you wanna stop internal loading of phosphorus. You need a lot more than that if you wanna support fish. Um, you've got to have enough phosphorus binder present already to make it work. Oxygen's great. If you don't have a binder present, you're in trouble. If you've had iron as the main binder and you've had hydrogen sulfide being produced for years, the sulfur scavenges the iron and it's no longer available. You may have to put something back in. And again, if non, not breaking stratification is a part of the goal, this is one way to do it. Okay, the alternative is destratifying oxygenation or artificial circulation. And you can do that with diffused air. You're really not getting much out of the air bubbles in terms of transfer. The transfer is less than 3% per meter it rises, ball to yard, whatever. Once you put it in that water 10 foot deep, you're only getting 9% transfer. You put it in 50 foot deep, I mean, that's 16 meters or whatever. Maybe you're getting 50% transfer, but you're not getting that much. Uh, and certainly not in the bottom water. It's really the movement of the water that the bubbles are doing. They're not hurting you in terms of gas transfer, but the real value comes from moving the water around and getting oxygenated surface water down to the bottom. Um, that works in a case like this, but you need a bunch of power to do it. Downdraft pump takes the oxygenated water and thrusts it down to the bottom. That's philosophically very desirable, but you're gonna stir up the bottom if you don't have deflector plates or enough depth to release it. They like these to be used in water 30 foot deep or more. Eh, a lot of lakes don't have that. Or you can use an updraft pump, solar being the most commonly known one. 
pulls water from the bottom up or from wherever you put the intake. A lot of solar bees are only put down eight or 10 foot and they're just mixing up aluminum. That's not doing anything about the bottom water. And if you put it to the bottom and you pull up that water, you have to keep doing that to make sure you don't get anoxic bottom water. So otherwise you're pulling up all that poor oxygen water and nutrients with it and releasing it in the upper water where it can grow algae. So you gotta be very careful with this technique. Key factors, you gotta move enough water to prevent thermal gradients from setting up. That's hard to do. Um, you need more water, more energy as the water warms. Keep in mind, you're not getting rid of heat with this. You're actually putting heat in. Maybe not a lot, but the point is you're not getting rid of heat. The warmer the water gets, the harder it is to mix. You need more energy. So there are very few circulation systems built to handle hot, dry summer weather, even in New England, and certainly not in Florida. So this is a problem. If you're using air, you need about 1.3 cubic feet per minute per acre as a minimum. You may need more than two cubic feet per minute where it's warm. Uh, general guideline, you got to pump at least 20% of the target volume per day. Sometimes you need to move as much as 100%. So if you want circulation to work, you need to build one big honking system, or it's going to fail some of the time, probably in the summer, and it may cost you a blue. The delivery of oxygen to the bottom is difficult to do without sediment resuspension. That's a little tricky, and there's a lot of uh, vendor techniques and tricks that they use for that, but it, you know, you, it's not just a matter of stirring the place up. And you've got to move surface water to a depth greater than three times the Secchi disk reading to actually lower algal biomass. Otherwise, you're just going to expect shifts in the type of algae. If you truly get lower phosphorus, you may get um, some reduction. But whatever phosphorus is in that water is going to be readily available because it's getting circulated around and around and around. So oftentimes, you can shift away from cyanobacteria, and that may be good enough but you're not likely to get a whole lot less where you're not likely to get great clarity from a circulation system unless it's a big enough system to really do the job. Okay, so to conclude, <laughs> for the ones I just talked about, the ordering by effectiveness, most to least, dredging, phosphorus inactivation, oxygenation, hypomimetic withdrawal than anything else in terms of what you can count on. Ordering by cost though is almost the reverse. Hypomimetic withdrawal, if it's passive, phosphorus inactivation, hypomimetic draw if it's active and you have to pump, oxygenation and dredging. And the other ones I can't even tell you what they really cost because it's too variable yet. And I can't tell you they're even going to be successful. So with that, we can open discussion. This is the last part, by the way, uh, of reduced growth of algae as a managing approach. Part two. Okay. Would you be surprised to find out that there's a good number of questions? No, not at all. <laughs> <After that. laughs> we'll go back to the um, the um, just something that was mentioned early on, and I think is important to consider is that there was a really big effort by lots of of scientists, managers across the country to try to look at cyanobacteria management techniques for the ITRC. Gina posted that in the chat. Um, and so they came out with some, some information that was supposed to be a giant review of a lot of different approaches. So in addition to everything that Ken said today, that is also a good resource and with looking at options and also looking at price specifically. So there has been some questions about price and there's still a few more down here <laughs> that you now, I was I at. was a reviewer for that particular report. I don't know how much of what I suggested went into it, but I, I would recommend, I think it's a well done piece of work. It is not particularly biased. It's done by a lot of different people as a committee collaborative. You know, it, it's gonna fall short in a few areas, but it's a good piece of work. Mm -hmm. uh, so, they have one question. Ken, do you have references to re to research on the mixing depth of boat propeller wash on sediment disturbance? The ones that I found are old, 1970s to 80s, and involve small outboard motors, maximum 75 horsepower. No, there's there's definitely references. In fact, um, they just came out with the wake boat study in Minnesota that I know was redone here as a webinar, and they didn't really do the vertical part, they did the horizontal part, now they're going to. Danielle Wayne up at the Seven Lakes Alliance and Colby College in Maine did a study on it, and she was fully expecting, I think, to get it 
penetrate more. And she found the same thing. That the lake was 20 foot deep and it did not stir up the bottom. Um, I've done actual measurements myself. And admittedly, I haven't done a lot of this since the 1990s, but it's not the 70s and the 80s. And again, it, it, you can actually calculate this. The thermal gradient that exists is just too high to let the power of those engines push it down. It, just, it may oscillate a little bit, but it is too strong. The same reason it doesn't destratify from the wind. It just, it can't, you don't have the power in those boats to actually break the stratification more than about 15 feet down. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a physical truth, you know? Is it possible in some way, some out? Sure. But is it gonna be a routine means of resuspending? Uh-uh, I've never seen it. I've measured the turbidity off and on. Now I will tell you that if you go to a lake and you measure turbidity in the water, a vertical profile all weekend long on a nice holiday weekend in the summer, you bet it's gonna go up in, in near the top all summer long. So yes, it's stirring up stuff from shallow water. But you measure that down at the bottom, it doesn't change. It's not mixing the deep water. And Danielle's on the call actually right now. So I don't know if she has a link that would be useful for people about that study, but feel free to put it in the chat, Danielle, if you're, if you're still on. Uh, okay. Uh, there, the there are others, uh, there's work done on the Fox Chain of Lakes in Wisconsin and Illinois. Uh, there, there's a bunch of them out there. It isn't all just old stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Was the figure of less than two milligrams of oxygen per liter when phosphorus is released during redox? So say the first the, part I, again, how many milligrams? That was the figure, did it say on the figure less than two milligrams of oxygen per liter when phosphorus is released during redox? I think maybe the whatever value it was on that graph, which oh, was a yeah, if, if you're less than two milligrams per liter in the water column, there is a decent chance you could have release going on at the sediment water interface, yes. First off, the oxygen will decline much quicker as you get near that interface and be low in it. If it's more than two milligrams per liter, there's probably enough oxygen to keep it from ever moving into the water column. It's not gonna stop cyanobacteria growing right at the sediment water interface and popping up, but it, it, it will at least keep the phosphorus from getting in the water column. Yeah. When it's okay. Over. And do you think longer periods of lake stratification will increase the likelihood of blooms? And yes. if so, is there a particular length of time that might be a trigger? Um, I don't think it's a trigger or a threshold effect. It's, it's a gradient, but absolutely. The longer stratification that's going with climate change means that there's a longer period of time to suck the oxygen out of the bottom and get that anoxic sediment, which needs more amount of time to load it with phosphorus which means a higher probability we're going to see blooms from it. Yes. And uh, maybe this is too late, although maybe it could go back. Uh, somebody wanted you to go a little more slowly, Janine, through species that tend to grow at different lake levels. You went through that f fairly quickly. She was the looking species for- Species that- so is, Oh, oh grow at different of which species. Yeah, well, this will be made available to everybody, but yeah, I can scroll back. That one, right? Yeah, you, you got the, the classic ones that grow on the bottom and pop up are the four on the bottom left. Gliotrichia, delicious sperma, methanosomin, and microcystis. And, and we're at Chinia too. I'm sorry, the whole bottom panel, except for Planktothrix, which along with Chrysosphorella and Sinura and some other goldens, Denobrian, tend to be thermocline bloomers. They tend to grow the layer in the middle. Um, and then Along with Planktothrix, you often get Sudanabena and Planktolingia. So if you're lower in your oxygen probe and you suddenly get a spike of oxygen right near the thermocline, that tells you you've got algae growing there. And then the, the shallow water mat formers, there are some cyanobacteria that will do this like um, oscillatory and formidium, but the greens, uh, uh, Spirogyra, Zygnema, Mujosha, uh, those are the, the Zygni metales group, which are real slimy, and then Clodophora, Rhizoclonium, Pithophora, which are the coarser Brillo patty type greens. Those are two major groups that grow in the shallower water using nutrients from the sediment water interface, but lots of light from the top, and they like the higher nitrogen phosphorus ratio. Hopefully that covers what they're asking. Again, there are texts of Reynolds, uh, algal ecology goes through some of this. 
Um, I mean, our, our, our workshop covers it as well, the whole lecture on algal ecology. Mm -hmm. and, and as a reminder, these will all be recorded, chopped up and made available so you could watch them multiple times <laughs> if, if certain sections are gone through too fast. But thank you for going back on that. Um, bunch of questions, okay. Okay, so I guess this was a general question. So climate change seems to be leading towards more blooms in general? Yes, and more cyanobacteria specifically. Mm -hmm. I and, just, think uh, it well, just think it is growing season, you know, it's longer. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a general question about how nutrient levels change from April to September. Um, I don't know if that's... It's actually a very good question. Mm -hmm. It's going to depend on your lake and its watershed. Uh, the general thing we think about, the classic stratified north temperate lake, gets a lot of stuff in the spring as the snow melt and rain landing on still largely frozen or saturated ground creates a lot of runoff. So our peak concentrations happen then. Then we go into a period in the summer where there's less inflow. If there's going to be peaks then, it's going to be because of internal loading. And then we come back to the fall, the lake mixes and you may get some of that phosphorus from the bottom getting put into the top, even if it didn't diffuse up there to begin with. And on top of it, you have all the leaves falling off the trees and decaying and going in. There is a remarkable pulse, typically in late October and early November, if you're not in a place where they collect the leaves, of nutrients going into the lake then. Most of it isn't dissolved, it's particulate stuff, but you get loaded at that time of year again. So you have two big peaks, spring and fall, which are based on the watershed. If you're managing the watershed well, they won't be big peaks. And you have possible peaks in the summer and then into the fall with turnover based on internal loading. So in a lake that's really dominated by watershed influences, the highest phosphorus is spring and fall. In a lake that's dominated by internal processes, it's in the summer. So if you have a lake that has blooms from spring on, it's mostly watershed. If you have a place that really gets it in late summer, that's just a tip off that it's internal loading. Now, again, that internal loading is a function of what's come in over the watershed over a long period of time, but it's the internal load that's causing the, the proximal problem. Okay, and this question might be hard to answer because it's about a specific lake, but I think you can look at it in general. How can we dredge on Cheshire Lake or whatever lake with wetland protection? Like, how does that, that dynamic between wetland protection rules and dredging work? Well, I don't know what state they're in. That does matter. But uh, it, it's, it's a function of how the regulations, you know, what they let you do or not do. There's nothing, again, in any wetland protection regulation, the idea is to protect wetland resources. And the lake is a wetland resource, or the, at least the land under it. Uh, so if you're improving that resource by removing the sediment, that's considered a good thing. But in the course of doing it, you drain the lake and kill everything that was in it, or you dry up the adjacent wetland, those are negatives. So there's a balancing act to be had. And it really depends on where you are. It's not hard to dredge a lake in Connecticut as long as you have the money. It's real hard to do it in Massachusetts. Yeah, she's in, Cheshire, she's in Cheshire, Massachusetts. Okay, in Massachusetts, yeah. it's hard. Um, you, you've got to be willing to go through, jump through a lot of hoops, some of them flaming. You have to do a lot of sediment testing uh, and they decide when you've tested enough. You don't get to make that call. Uh, it's going to cost a lot. And then when you actually go to do the dredging, there's all kinds of precautions you have to take. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying the focus is on doing no harm, not on fixing a problem. It's the fundamental problem of regulation. Regulations are not set up to fix things. They're set up to protect things or not let bad things happen in the first place. And that's a problem. Um, where we have degraded lakes, it's much harder to fix them than it would have been to protect them. But it's done, it's there, you gotta fix it. Well, you don't have to fix it. And again, if you have endangered species, particularly in Massachusetts, it, it's not gonna matter. If whatever the act is to fix the lake is gonna harm the endangered species, you're not likely to be allowed to do it. And that's just the way the regulations are set up. Mm -hmm. I can't control that. I, again, I didn't get into my standard speech of the three-legged stool of lake management, but it's science, economics, and institutions. 
and the permanent falls under institutions. The science is all understandable. Everybody gets the economics. I can tell you what it costs. You can tell me you can afford it. No one seems to have control over the institutional part. And that's where we fall down in lake management 99% of the time. And there are talks about this, papers about this from the 1980s, and nothing has changed. What can I tell you? Okay. Um, another dredging related question. Is there any evidence that select dredging can help reduce blooms? For example, only 10% of a lake near outfall locations. So yeah, only a portion it, and more selectively. It, it can, but you've got to be really careful. Doing it by an outlet's about the least advantageous because water's going out right from there. Uh, you're better, what you need to do is dredge to a depth where the exposed sediment does not have a lot of phosphorus that's going to get released. How deep is that? Well, we actually just determined in Missisquoi Bay and Lake Champlain, that's about a foot. You don't even have to go to two feet. I just did a tiny little one in Cambridge. Well, it's not done yet. We just did the assessment. You need about 18 inches. And what's left is clean underneath. It's not going to become a problem. But you've got to dredge that amount out. Now you can look at what area do you do? Well, if I did it right in 10% of the area that needs it, I'm getting 10% of the benefit, not much. If I do it half right over the whole area, maybe I get nothing. It's, so it's a, that's the problem with dredging. It's kind of an all or nothing proposition. You can certainly decide which areas give you the biggest bang for the buck, but that may not be enough by itself. And one other dredging related question, how much of a risk uh, is there of increasing invasive populations with dredging and or mechanical cutting or removing? Over what was the last one? How much risk of invasive yeah. population increase is involved with dredging or mechanical cutting, removing right. algae? But versus something else or just, just I guess those two? General. Okay. Well, I mean, it's, it's an answerable question. Uh, when you dredge, you're making a total restart for the system. If you expose new seed beds, those are what will grow first. If you expose nothing but a pretty sterile sandy substrate, not much is going to grow. And then it's a question of what comes in. It may be something a species is considered native, but it's still an invader in that case. Or you go in and actively plant it, or you hope that the coarse nature of the substrate just doesn't let anything grow there. Um, so there, you know, if you Dredge and you take away the plants that are there, yeah, it's an increased risk of something else coming in. What was there might have been milfoil anyway. <laughs> it may have been an invasive species. Um, in terms of harvesting, that's a tougher call. It, it kind of depends. Most harvesting just cuts the plants at some distance below the surface, and the plant is still there covering the bottom and growing back. It's really just mowing the lawn. Now, I haven't put fertilizer or weed killers or anything on my lawn in 37 years. And I still have the same species that were out there from when I mowed. Nothing is invaded. And I think that's fairly true in lakes as well. However, if you're overzealous and you cut right near the bottom or actually rip stuff out and you expose areas, yeah, it's gonna increase the probability of invasive species. Okay, most efforts to reduce the addition of nutrients focus on reducing phosphorus. Should we also be trying to um, worry about, let's see, additions of organic material the bacteria can grow on in the sediment consuming oxygen, photosynthesis by algae and plants add organic matter to lakes. Does that photosynthesis make efforts to control added organic material and what nutrients would be the most important to limit additions? Does that make sense? It's in the chat. Not completely, but it but it is absolutely true that most of these growth control methods target phosphorus. That's because cyanobacteria don't care if, if you've controlled the nitrogen. In fact, if you control the nitrogen and not the phosphorus, you're going to get more cyanobacteria blooms. Now, there are people, particularly out West, um, Alex Horn is one, who feels that nitrogen control can reduce algal biomix. And I'm not going to argue with him. I mean, he's got real cases where it's done it. But generally speaking, they're both important but you want low phosphorus and a high nitrogen phosphorus ratio. Controlling just nitrogen doesn't get you either of those. So I can see doing both. I cannot see doing just nitrogen and not phosphorus. Now, that said, organic matter, I mean, the last thing I wanna do is put more organic matter in a lake. That's an oxygen demand. 
Uh, and oxygen is so crucial in our lakes. It's a source of phosphorus when it decays. It may create the anoxic conditions that allow phosphorus to get released from other compounds that are there. I think that controlling organic material additions to lake is really important and that not on my list is a positive thing to do at all. Mm -hmm. And there was a question or a statement. I was informed that FOSS lock would not be available starting in 2023. Do you know anything about that? Well, FOSS lock, I don't know when it's going to, if they're talking about Massachusetts, I don't know when it's going to be. You mean that the chemical itself won't be available? It's absolutely oh, I available. I don't know. Maybe. Okay. FOSS lock was marketed in the USA by CEPRO. The people who make FOSS lock have dissolved that arrangement and are now marketing them themselves. They actually have their own office and regional reps in the United States. So it's absolutely available. It is not permittable in certain states because it hasn't gone through the process yet. And again, I, there's not a lot to say on it. It's a slow process. I know, for example, in Massachusetts, there were concerns about the clay part of it maybe smothering mollusks. That's a pretty easy enough test to do. And frankly, the amount of material we're talking about is so small, I think it's an infinitesimal probability. But since it hasn't been done, I can't say that it's absolutely out of the question. Um, and I don't think that's the only reason it's been held up. I was told at one point, well, you have aluminum, why do you need something else? It's like, ah, you know, I want as many tools in the toolbox as possible. Uh, but it hasn't been approved yet. I have no reason to believe it won't be. I can't tell you when. It's, out, it's institutional, it's out of my control. Um, so again, this is a specific lake, but maybe you can comment in general. In the past, I understand that in the past, Stiles Pond, Boxford was drained down to a river in the fall, and that froze the plant slash algae over overgrowth. It was then allowed to fill up naturally in the spring. Do you think that would help? Okay. You did not see drawdown mentioned here anywhere as an algal control technique. It's the flushing you can get by a drawdown, which sends stuff downstream has some benefits, but that's not for, that's not rooted plant control. Keep in mind, we could do this all over on rooted plant control. We're talking about algae here today, not rooted plants. The only rooted plants to which the supply are the floating ones like duckweed and wolfia, water hyacinth, things like that. Uh, we're really not dealing with the rooted plants, but I mean, I can answer that question. Drawdown in a good year, will freeze out vegetatively overwintering plants. So milfoil, fanwort, um, you know, a lot of the invasives, uh, will, it will do a good job on that. It will do nothing about seed producers that overwinter that way. The vast majority of the pondweeds, um, naiads, uh, you know, they're, they're really come back from seed every year. Some of them like Potomogeton, Amplifolius, big leaf pondweed does both. But drawdowns usually cause it to increase because it's very hardy. It doesn't freeze out very well. And it comes back from rhizomes and seeds the next year anyway. So drawdowns are a controversial technique. I like shallow drawdowns to protect the shoreline from ice damage and to maybe freeze out some of the shallow populations and actually let the fine sediments move offshore so we get a coarser peripheral area. Because frankly, most of our lakes, coarse substrates in short supply, and I prefer to get it that way. When you start doing deep drawdowns, you've got to think about a lot of other impacts downstream, um, whether the plants are susceptible, what it might do to mollusks that don't migrate very well, uh, what it does to habitat for fish, although sometimes it can all be benefits. There's a lot to consider in drawdown. But if you're dealing with a plant that overwinters in a vegetative state, drawdown when you get good freezing conditions will work. Of course, it used to be that every other year in New England was a good year for drawdown. Now it's about every third year. And the problem is, you know, which year it's going to be. So you have to do it every year. And two of those years, it may not work out very well. And whatever negatives go with it, you're stuck with every year. So it's a hard one, but it's inexpensive, which is why it's popular. So uh, just for people who are interested in that wave question and the stirring up, there are two links uh, one, Danielle actually posted a YouTube video, I think, of maybe her talk at NALMS. And then there was another link that Bree shared looking at a recent study. It might have been, I think it's the study in Minnesota. So look at for those links if you want to know more about that.
Okay, a little more on, on algal control by drawdown and why I don't even mention it. It's true that when you first do a drawdown, there's a pretty good chance that stuff's going to decompose in the exposed zone. And then when you refill it, those nutrients are going to be readily available and you could get more algae. But it all depends on whether or not you just barely refill it or in the spring you get flushed multiple times, in which case it's all downstream. If you've been doing drawdown for a long time, though, that's already happened and you're not likely to get anything more from it. So it's sort of neutral in the long run. I don't see it as a major threat to creating more blooms. I also don't see it though as a way to stem blooms because most of our problems are from water deeper than where a drawdown occurs. Okay, and uh, doo -doo -doo, we keep going, keep going. Uh, would peroxide treatment improve oxidative processes in the sediments? Yes, although the amount you're talking about is probably infinitesimal compared to what the demand is. It's not going to hurt, but I don't think it'll make a measurable difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long does alum treatment last? What is the cost per acre? Okay, that I can do off the top of my head. Um, the the duration of benefits, and that paper by Huser is a good, good example. Um, it depends on how shallow it is, how big an area you're doing. But if you just think of it, I've got a square meter of muck that's letting phosphorus out. I want to do something about that. If I treat it the way we would normally do it, we would be targeting the upper 10 centimeters, four inches of sediment. If I do that and I inactivate the phosphorus that's in there, that's done, it's not coming back. The only way phosphorus is gonna come out of that square meter of sediment now is if it moves in from the watershed and lands on it, fills in over top, and that takes time, or that was deeper than 10 centimeters, I only inactivated the upper 10 centimeters, and now the stuff is gonna start migrating up from below. Best guess is about half a centimeter a year, so 10 centimeters buys you 20 years. In shallower lakes, they find they get less duration, though, which probably means there's, there's more loading per unit area from the watershed or unit volume from the watershed. There's more processing of that stuff faster, and the sediment itself can get resuspended and moved around by circulation and wind action because it's exposed to that, and even boats because it is shallower. But once you get to a stratified point, and stratified is usually something deeper than 15 feet, which matches pretty well with where I'm saying you don't get mixing from natural or boating influences, um, that should buy you like 20 years. If you do it right, you don't put enough in, that's another story. You have to test the sediment and figure out what the dose needs to be. And that dose is incredibly variable. The lowest I've done is 10 grams per square meter, and the highest I've done is 108 grams per square meter. So a tenfold difference. And I can tell you that there are some Western and Midwestern lakes where they've done 200 grams per square meter. So it's a 20 fold possible range. The value for cost is about $50 per gram per square meter per acre treated. So if I was gonna do a dose of 50 grams per square meter, which is the average New England dose, it would cost me $2,500 per acre to do that. But I don't know what the dose is for any given lake till I look at it, and I don't know how many acres we have to do. So the cost has to be worked out for all that. All this is covered in a paper I did in 2017 about aluminum treatments of lakes on Cape Cod in lake and reservoir management. So you can look that up and it walks through all that. Great. Uh, have you seen any phosphorus inactivation work using zero valent iron? Yes. Um, that, that, but you can't do it uh, with no oxygen. That, that's done coupled with oxygenation projects. The best examples are upper Midwest reservoirs of Badnay and Pleasant, which are water supplies for St. Paul, Minneapolis area. Um, they, they've done all sorts of oxygenation. And there's a great paper that won Best Paper Award by Dan Engstrom, maybe 10 years ago, that said, you know what, it's a time bomb. You have all this iron-bound phosphorus sitting on the bottom. Uh, and if your oxygenation system ever goes, it's going to go crazy in here. So they, they beefed up their oxygenation system to make sure they could do it. But they were adding iron to that. Um, also, the zero valence stuff is often done as uh, a barrier. They, like if you have high phosphorus in groundwater, they'll literally bury a wall of the stuff and make it pass through it. 
so that now there's iron binding the phosphorus and as soon as it's oxygenated, it hangs onto it. But again, iron in any form, to the best of my knowledge, is not a good binder in the absence of oxygen. You have to provide the oxygen. If you provide the oxygen, then you have to ask if you really need the iron or not. But if you've been doing this a long time and the iron's been binding up all the phosphorus, yeah, you might. Okay. And I also uh, actually missed about the wave part. Danielle said she has a white paper she's willing to share and she put her email in the chat. Um, Not a way, Danielle. What, what organizations are working towards state regulatory updates and increased state resources to help watersheds and localities monitor and address algae problems? Well, this, I, if I'm understanding it correctly, we're redoing the manual for Massachusetts right now. Uh, which is the Practical Guide to Lake Management in Massachusetts, which is a cut down version of the generic environmental impact report for eutrophication and rooted plant control in lakes, uh, which was 700 pages long. We had a version in 2004 that was about 160 pages long and just took a technique by technique, how it works, benefits, drawbacks, key things you gotta know, permits, all that sort of stuff. But a lot has changed in 17 years, so we're redoing it. Other than the permit aspect, the stuff applies to everybody everywhere. So it'll be useful anywhere when we're done with it. I, I suspect a couple of states will just steal it because it's public information and change the permit part and slap another cover on it. It's fine by me. Uh, and we're trying to cover everything, which means there's a section on the mainstay techniques, the things that are reliable, that we know how they work. Doesn't mean they always work, but we know what they'll do if it's done right and the key things you got to know. And there's a whole nother section that isn't written yet that's challenging about all these other techniques that they have merit, like the bacterial additives. But I can't really tell you exactly how to use it or what to do or how to get a permit for it because we don't know yet. We don't have enough of a track record to say, here's how you use it reliably. So that some of those are going to be problems. There are things like grass carp. Grass carp are not legal in Massachusetts. You can use them in Connecticut in smaller ponds. New York, you can use them. I don't think you can use them in Maine, New Hampshire, or Vermont either. You know, it, it, again, it may just be prohibited. So we've got a bunch of stuff to sort out. Um, diet for a small lake put out by uh, New York is a very good reference. It's getting old now, but it's still a really good reference. And they do a nice thing where here's what the literature says. Here's what we know really happens. I love it. it it's, you know, it's the practice. The theory and the practice are not always the same. And, and that's a good Good reference to get and that's easily acquired from uh the full of federation of lake associations in new york who has a conference in early may every year uh, there, there's there's plenty of good stuff out there admittedly it gets old and there's a textbook on this the last version it's cook at all 2005 yeah you think maybe we've learned a few things in 17 years we have so it's already getting defunct but those guys are not doing it again they're they say we're done they're all retired so um there's material out there. The part that's hardest is the institutional side. You need to understand how things are done in your state. And that is not easy for me to tell you. I mean, it could change tomorrow. We have a bizarre regulation that's just being, it's always been there. It's just been reinterpreted. That It used to be if you took out 100 cubic yards of sediment or more, that was dredging. So you could clean a catch basin. You could scrape up some stuff from your shoreline. But you needed a full water quality certification under Section 401 of the Clean Water Act administered through the state of Massachusetts if you took out more than 100 cubic yards. Okay, that's, we live with that. Now they're saying if you take out 100 cubic yards of vegetation by harvesting, that also requires a water quality certificate. It blows me away. It's an interpretation of the rule. The rule hasn't changed any. We never had to do that before. As far as I know, no one's gotten a permit yet. And I've got a client that does a major harvesting program every year. Now we got to get that other permit. So there isn't necessarily, there may be rhyme and reason to it, but there isn't any way for me to tell you, oh, here's how it works in every state and here's all you got to do. It changes year to year, hopefully as we learn things, but also just as the personnel change. And I, I call people now and ask for things and I can hear them leafing through the pages. So I can read this online. I'm looking for your professional judgment. Well, that's above my pay grade. You know, it, it's a hard situation right now in regulatory agencies. These people have a job to do. They mean well and they try hard. But the regulations themselves, not the people, are set up only to protect 
they're not set up to fix problems. And that's a real problem. We, our agencies, in some cases they are, but for the most part, the regulatory agencies are not geared up to solve your problem. They're only geared up to let you do something that doesn't cause another problem. So I guess it used that, to be that way. Didn't used to be that way. So I guess then the question that she was really, really getting at is, is anybody trying to reform? You know, so saying this right now is one thing, but is anybody or any group trying to take this sort of message and work with states to try to reform regulations to make it easier to accomplish objectives, thinking about how you might reduce cyanobacteria problems? Only in a reactionary mode. I know, for example, New York, partly because of budget crisis, decided to change the level of monitoring needed in their lakes. So their C-SLAP program would be doing less, therefore they would have to fund less. And of course they revolted against that change and I don't know how it's come down yet, but they're looking to say, no, this is wrong. You need these data and, and, and they're correct. You do need the data. The cutbacks were not well informed. Um, in Massachusetts, they came out with new regulations in 2014 and supposedly there was a comment period. I never heard about it until they were finally said too bad. So I think the answer is no. There really isn't anybody from proactive stance. NOMS on a you know, national, international level certainly looks at these things, but they're not going to go to a state and say, hey, guys, you're, you're messing this up. You need to do it differently. Um, it's people like me and I get, you know, I'm not on their Christmas card list because I'm always fighting with them about stuff. Um, and I don't mean them any personal ill will. I, I like most of these people personally quite a lot. But professionally, again, it is not their job to fix like problems. I mean, classic example, every state I know of has a law that says you can't bring an invasive species in. You know any that don't up here? I don't. However, does any of them have a law that says if you get an invasive species, you have to do something about it? Not a one, not a one. And if I wanna do something about it, it's all on me to file the permit, find the money and get the job done without damaging any other part of the ecosystem that's covered by the permit. Something's wrong there. If it's important enough to have a law that says you can't bring them in, why isn't it important enough to say, when you get it, you should do something and here's what it is. I rest my case. <laughs>